language and other cognitive systems. So this talk is going to uh, focus on that, the relationships between them, and the, 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 over, the overarching uh, conception involved with this is that we have one cognitive, we have one cognition. It, in effect, it's, um, it's uh, a challenge to the previous model of Fodor and Chomsky, which was that there are watertight compartments called modules. And so, for example, there's the language organ, which is uh, a uh, autonomous module in cognition, which uh, just does language. And it seems to me that uh, very little in cognition, indeed, is uh, independent. I suspect that there's a large amount of interaction and overlap. And in particular, there's a large amount of structural uh, similarity across them. So um, my whole object is to, it's what I call the overlapping systems model of cognitive organization, is to um, identify uh, a set of uh, large-scale, dis roughly distinct cognitive systems that we have, and then see how they, what kinds of structural, major structural properties they have in common. And uh, in fact, the finding is, so let me just list a few of the, uh, uh, the major cognitive systems that I, I think are, are roughly there. Again, it's roughly, and I call them systems instead of modules in order to choose a different word than the one that suggests um, uh, what are uh, auto total autonomy? So I, I use the word systems for these, and they would include language, the language system, um, m with a much fuzzier boundary than the language module of Fodor. Uh, it would include perception, either as a whole or in its various modalities, so in particular vision, visual perception, auditory perception, kinesthetic perception, feeling, and so forth. It would include um, motor control as a system, it would, and, and I, I propose that there is also an affect system for emotions and feelings. There is what I suspect is a, a culture system, a part of the brain dedicated to um, uh, structuring our, our cultural patterns. Uh, and um, there would be uh, what I propose as an, as an understanding or reasoning uh, cognitive system. And, uh, and so the over, by the overlapping systems model, the, the concept is that um, uh, each one of these approximate large-scale cognitive systems might have a few organizing characteristics that are uniquely its own. There will be other organizing characteristics, structuring characteristics, properties that uh, are shared across several of these. Uh, cognitive systems, and there will be some which are so ge general and so fundamental that they will run across all the different cognitive systems. Uh, just an, an immediate example of that would be hierarchical embedding. So one thing embedded within another within another, I think, is something that runs across. Uh, we can find in virtually every, uh, as a structuring phenomenon, in virtually every cognitive system. So. Um, the, uh, so let me, I just listed some of what I think are the, the main um, uh, substantive cognitive systems. And then I listed second there, I guess it's in 1.2, uh, what are some of the structural fact features, uh, I'm going to call them organizing factors, that run through some or all of these different cognitive systems. They run through language, they run through different modalities within perception, they run through motor control and so forth. Um, uh, and there is some number of them, I'm only going to mention a few, uh, but you can look at it uh, at your leisure. Uh, so uh, the, among the, the main ones, um, the first one would, would simply be schematic structure, um, some kind of abstractive delineations uh, that uh, exist within any given cognitive system. Uh, so language certainly has a schematic system. It's in, in fact embodied by the, the closed class forms, which I'll describe in a second. Um, in visual perception, there's schematic structuring in terms of the, the, 
the delineations that you see, for example, in dividing a room into its parts and so forth. Um, in motor control, it would be the, the distinct movements that you can make as delineated, uh, distinguished from each other. Um, uh, another um, uh, organizing factor would be temporal, the temporal structure of something. And this, again, cuts across all the different cognitive systems, and, and it would include things like phase, so the start or stop or continuation or absence of, uh, of some process going on in one or another of these cognitive systems. Um, it would include um, things like speeding up and slowing down, um, or coming to a stop, or starting up. It would include uh, coordination of uh, such things like um, alt alter alternating things, or coordinating uh, processes across systems. It would include things like putting something on hold until some trigger starts it up again. All of these would be aspects of uh, would be aspects of a um, uh, temporal structure that presumably runs through all of the different cognitive systems. Um, a third organizing feature would be causality. Uh, so any way in which um, some uh, uh, phenomenon or process within any of the systems causes another one or is caused by something outside itself, these would all be part of that. And then to switch, just to stop with those three there, and then to switch to the cognizing or factors, um, we've got attention, attentional structure. So within every system, uh, cognitive system, you can direct the different patterns of attention over the phenomena. You can direct different patterns of attention over what you see, over if you're moving different parts of your movement, over different parts of what you're saying. So uh, this is all the attentional system. Uh, there's the perspectival system, or, or you know, perspectival organizing factor, which is something like which perspective point you're, you're looking at the uh, the system, the other elements of the system from. Um, there's the, the memory system, so which, there's working memory, which, or which, which elements of a current system can be easily held in working memory, which ones cannot, which ones can be readily maintained in long-term memory, and so forth, that, that, which um, or the difference between familiarity and novelty is built on um, whether you remember it or not, and uh, that distinction can probably show up in any of the cognitive systems. So this gives you an idea of what I mean by the, the distinction between the substantive cognitive systems, things like the language system, perception, motor control, affect or emotion, the understanding system, those are the substantive cognitive systems, and these organizing factors, these are the structural uh, aspects that either uh, show up just in one of them, one of the substantive systems, or across several, or across running all across all of them. So that's the rough idea of um, how I'm seeing this, and uh, I'm so I call it the overlapping systems model of cognitive organization. And it's, it's as I say, it's in direct um, a challenge to the Fodorian notion of, uh, of uh, autonomous modules. So uh, there are so if we've got comparable structural features, uh, factors, organizing factors uh, across uh, different cognitive systems, what are the ways in which that could happen? So um, I uh, there is I can picture three main ways that you can have this kind of commonality of structuring of organization. And uh, they, they all have implications for, um, for evolution. Um, well, maybe I can, if I try to draw something on the board, I'll leave the microphone, so maybe I'll try and draw it in the air. Um, uh, so one way, is, and, and the evolutionary idea is that some cognitive systems are more ancient than others. So for example, vision and uh, motor control were, were in place in our, in our cognitive organization much longer than 
then what in humans is the last two cognitive systems to have evolved, namely language and culture. And again, I propose that there's a, uh, a, cog a cognitive system, substantive system, dedicated to acquiring and manifesting cultural patterns. You see it uh, to some degree in, in chimpanzees. It's, it's known that now that there are cultural differences across different chimpanzee groups, but it's really elaborated uh, in humans. So, um, uh, so since those are the, the last two to have evolved, how is it that they could have certain commonalities of structuring with previously existing? Uh, so here's, here's how that might go about. Let's say this is the circle, large circle is the totality of one's cognition. So let's say that there is some uh, structuring factor. Uh, so one way that you can have commonality is that there is some independent, separate neural system that is responsible for a certain kind of structuring. So let's say, just to pick one uh, out of that list I gave, let's say hierarchical embedding, the, the capacity to embed or nest hierarchically. Well, let's say within this total circle, there's some separate neural system that's, which, whose function is to be, enable hierarchical embedding, one thing inside of another inside of another. Well, if several cognitive systems exhibit that, so here's vision, here's the visual substance system, it would have to uh, establish neural connections to that uh, organizational uh, factor, neural, neural system, in order to manifest hierarchical embedding within vision. Uh, the same would happen with this motor control over here. It would have to establish connections to that. And then let's say language evolves last, so let's say there's a language system here, then it, if it exhibits hierarchical embedding, which it does, then presumably it, by this account, it would have to develop connections to this um, little uh, neural system that handles hierarchical embedding. Okay, there's, there's a, um, another way that you can account for commonality of structural organization. And that is, let's say, uh, some, uh, namely that it's located in the, in, the, in the, at the outset within a single substantive cognitive system. So let's say the structural capacity to embed hierarchically first evolved in visual perception, just to, just to pick something. So then here's all of cognition, here's the visual system, and within the visual system, long ago evolved, there is a portion of that system, a, a neural subsystem, which is responsible for hierarchical embedding. Well, if language evolves later, um, so in other words, there is in the brain somewhere, it, it happens to be located within the visual system, let's say, uh, there is, the brain now has a system which is capable of orchestrating uh, hierarchical embedding. Well, if language then comes along later and evolves as a, as a new, approximately distinct cognitive system, it might develop connections to that subsystem already within vision. So in this respect, it, um, it, the evolution of language depends on tapping into, making connections with, uh, a subsystem already present, long since evolved, as part of some already existing uh, cognitive system, let's say visual perception. Okay, that's the second model. The third possibility that accounts for common structure is that there are uh, each separate cognitive system, like vision and motor control and language, has its own copy of this subsystem. So language has a little subsystem for uh, multiple, uh, multiple embedding. So does vision have one, and motor control has another one. So then the question is, how did those uh, separate copies arise? Well, there's several um, evolutionary accounts. One, one is that um, uh, it apparently often happens that a a previous structure uh, can, through some mutation, 
get copied. A copy of it is simply uh, produced. At first, it's a mistake. But once it's there, it can be uh, utilized. I mean, the, the notion might be uh, just a, a, a gross physical example. Some people are born with a sixth finger um, as, a, as, a, as a mutation. Well, in time, if, if that doesn't hurt anything, it might stay in place and get used as a specialized, uh, as, as another copy. Um, well, so that's one way that, it, let's say, vision already had a, uh, a subsystem for embedding, uh, multiple embedding, so as maybe some uh, neural tissue copy by mutation was made over here, and let's say some language like language system evolved around that and included it automatically. That's one way. Another way is um, uh, convergent evolution. It could just be that certain structuring characteristics are uh, so uh, fall out so readily, uh, can evolve uh, so, so readily that uh, they independently evolve in each of the three systems, or each of the many cognitive systems. And uh, a fourth possibility is, uh, I mean, a uh, third one is just pure accident, coincidence. So anyway, these are these are the um, these are the three main models by which you can account for commonality of structuring across different cognitive systems uh, and their evolutionary implications. Um, oh yeah, okay. So. So if you look over now, if you look over the various cognitive systems, uh, the substantive cognitive systems, language has, and look at their structural characteristics, it turns out that language has, it seems, is certain possibly unique ones, or, or most, um, is the most elaborated in language. Um, which in itself has to be accounted for, and in fact my last talk will We'll address this directly. Uh, the last talk is on the evolution of language. Um, but uh, the, one of the rare or unique properties, structural properties of language, is that it has two co-systems that are that uh, are integrated with or are correlated with each other. One is uh, it, it's an, essentially the the basic saussure type of observation about language. There are, is a linkage between um, meaning and form, the form meaning association, the uh, standard notion of, of morphemes. So you know you have a certain phonological shape like bucket, and associated with that is a certain concept, this, this object. And so you have, I'm calling this here the uh, relationship between two co-systems, the expression co-system, which means how you, the, the overt form that you use, and the um, conceptual co-system, co which is correlated with it, which is the concept that is associated with it. Now, if you look around various cognitive, other cognitive systems in, let's say, vision, then you're hard put to see anything comparable in that. I mean, is vision, is there a difference between an expression co-system and a conceptual co-system? It doesn't, that makes sense. What about motor control? Similarly, it doesn't quite fit. So, um, so maybe language or any kind of communication system, uh, it could be you know, some kind of gestural system as well, is um, perhaps unique in having that kind of correlation. In addition, uh, within the expressional system uh, of any communication type system like language, um, it has two subsystems, uh, language has two subsystems, namely, what I'm calling the open class subsystem and the closed class subsystem. And, uh, and, and again, this is what uh, I, I can uh, I'll address uh, more. In a second, I'll summarize this. In a second, I will um, uh, just expand a little further on what I mean by open versus closed class. But first, um, there's the issue of uh, what can, uh, how can we under, undertake this comparison across cognitive uh, systems? Let's say between language and something else. How is it even possible to do so? We have to have some points of 
of the correspondence to the self, and it is in fact a problem. For example, um, if the whole point of my comparison is to compare what is structural, uh, what is organizational across different cognitive systems, but how do we know what is organizational and structural? So within language, luckily, uh, as I'll expand on in a second, the closed class system, which is overtly detectable, you can discern the, the closed class system of language, um, is a subsystem of language which is dedicated to conceptual structure. The open class system is dedicated to conceptual content. The closed class system is dedicated to conceptual structure. So there is a, a division of labor, a fundamental division of labor between content and structure. Um, so uh, to use a, uh, an English uh, idiom, um, uh, language as a cognitive system hands you structure on a silver platter. It uh, has an overt, distinct system, um, easily identifiable, well, fairly easily identifiable, um, which is dedicated to, rep to representing conceptual structure. Possibly no other cognitive system has this. So for example, with vision, visual perception, um, most of what uh, perception psychologists deal with, they would probably say is structural within visual perception. But there is no, first of all, there's no determinative way for them to say that this is structural and that's not. So for, for example, you can ask a, of a perception psychologist, is color structural? I mean, a perception psychologist might easily say, well, the perceived delineations, outlines of things are structural. But then you can ask the psychologist, what about color? Is color structural? They would have no principled way to answer that. Unlike in language, you do. You have a principled way to answer, is X structural? Well, you can just say, well, is it expressed by a closed class form? If it is, it's structural. If it isn't, it's not. I mean, that's not the end of the story. That's too simple. But, but at least it's, it's a first kind of um, distinction you can make. There's nothing like that in vision. Similarly, uh, another problem is within vision, visual perception, there's no principled way to say at what stage of visual processing uh, a structure appears. In fact, it seems to appear all the way, so from the retina all the way back into the uh, optic, optical cortex and all the su successive um, processing that goes on, at each stage, something structural takes place in this processing, but no single stage seems to be privileged to be called the structuring subsystem of visual processing. So, um, whereas in language, nothing like that occurs. You have a given closed class system, which is its own stage, it's a single stage. There's no issue. So there are real problems in trying to even open the question of how to compare structure across cognitive systems. Um, my, uh, my methodology is to say, well, since the, the nature of structure as such uh, is given most explicitly, most definitively by language, Language is a good cognitive system to start such an investigation from. So you can go look at language first, start with language, see what kind of aspects of processing are structural in character, and see if something like that um, corresponds in other cognitive systems or doesn't correspond. So that's my methodology uh, for carrying on this cross-system comparison within cognition. Okay, uh, now just, uh, I'm going to switch to section two. This was the content of, um, of my first talk, and I don't want to repeat the whole thing for, uh, because people, uh, a number of people are here who have heard, heard my first talk.
But just to summarize it quickly, um, uh, what, uh, by definition, to define them quickly, uh, closed classes, closed class forms in any language are those forms which, those classes which have a, a large number of members and you can uh, add many members very easily. So, for example, nouns in English, uh, uh, simplex nouns in English, we have uh, hundreds of them, maybe thousands, I don't know. And it's very easy to add new nouns uh, in one day. And you just learn a, a bunch of new nouns. S same with verbs, same with adjectives. Um, but everything else is closed class. For example, uh, uh, and closed class forms come in, uh, they can be bound, such as inflections or um, derivations and so forth. Or they can be free forms, like uh, prepositions, so like or, or, or uh, classifiers or uh, uh, conjunctions. Uh, so these are, so for example, English has several dozen prepositions, like in, on, around, above, below, through, and so forth. And, um, but it only has several dozen, it doesn't have hundreds. And it's really hard to add a new preposition. You can't just go to a class and, and learn 10 new prepositions and go away, go away using them. So uh, closed classes are ones which have relatively few members, and it's very hard to add new ones. And, um, they, uh, and j the rest I'll leave off. I'll just say that the open class forms uh, in any given uh, sentence or portion of discourse, uh, they, they contribute the majority of the conceptual content of, of that sentence that's expressed by that sentence, whereas the closed class forms express the majority of its conceptual structure. So there's this content structure distinction. And since my whole issue here is, uh, this, this whole comparison is over structure, not over content. Um, it's, it's, it structures the organizational features of, of these different systems. Um, I'm automatically going to stick with uh, within language, just to the closed class forms. Uh, so that's all I'll stick with here in uh, all these comparisons. <clears throat> so uh, that's my summary for section two, and we can go on to section three. Hundred and twenty-four, page hundred twenty-four. What I'm going to do is uh, run a, a set of comparisons between. <clears throat> language and one other cognitive system. So in three, I'm going to compare language with a visual perception, compare it and contrast it, and we'll find that it's uh, partially overlapping. It's a, one of these partial overlaps. It, some things it has in, uh, in, in uh, some things vision has, a, only, only vision has that are absent from language. Next, we can look at structuring properties that language has that are absent from vision, and then we can look at things that are in fact in common, which are, in the case of language and vision, quite extensive, and which I think attests to the fact that, or to the theory that, as language evolved, it borrowed, in fact, I suspect that language borrowed most from vision, from visual perception, kinesthetic perception, uh, and from the reasoning or understanding system. It borrowed very little from other cognitive systems uh, like uh, affect or uh, the culture system. So in fact, after we get through with this language vision comparison, we'll go on to the uh, comparison between the structuring systems of language and the affect system, then to language and the uh, culture system, and then between language and the understanding system. And we'll see that there's a difference in how much there is overlap, how much overlap there is. Uh, so first then, between language and vision, and let's first look at the cases of non-overlap. Aspects of structuring that vision has that are pretty, pretty minimal in language structure. So here's a list of five, and I'll, I'll go first with uh, uh, the, the first one is uh, bilateral symmetry. It, 
it, it appears that, I mean, I understand from perception psychologists, that a strong aspect of structuring within vision is bilateral symmetry, seeing, uh, seeing that the two halves of something are reflections of each other, for example. Uh, like, for example, humans down uh, a midline axis, sort of reflections of each other's bilateral symmetry. Um, it's not clear to me why that's uh, so important, but I, I understand that it is. Well, uh, the, the language has very little in, in its closed class forms that express bilateral symmetry. Uh, the closest I can get is maybe each other, which is a closed class form. It's a, there, it's a free, in English at least, it's a free form, it's closed class. And for example, let's say you say they kissed each other. Well, maybe you can imagine an image of uh, a, a pair of uh, faces with lips meeting and so forth, sort of some kind of bilateral symmetry. Uh, that's, uh, and maybe one other example, uh, in, in classical Greek, uh, there are two closed class particles, which are men and dead, which mean on the one hand, on the other hand, but they're closed class particles, so we know that the language is treating them as uh, as, close, as part of the closed class structural system. Maybe that's an example, it's kind of balance, uh, even balance kind of thing, is another example. But it's, up beyond that, it's pretty minimal. Uh, so let's let's try another one. Uh, vision uh, all, uh, also has uh, a what I suspect is a elaborate system for uh, for, for scene parsing for parsing out kinds of rotation, whereas language is absolutely minimal with respect to that in its closed class system. So English and its closed class system has example, only two distinctions, over and around. These are closed class prepositioning things. I, I call them satellites. So, uh, and they, they um, distinguish the orientation of the spin axis of something that's rotating. So, for example, um, uh, around is where the spin axis is vertical. So this is around. So you can say, turn the pail around. Turning the veil this way. Over is where the spin axis is horizontal. So uh, I turn the pail over, you take the pail and you go like that. So English has this distinction, but that's all. Just that distinction. Um, everything else is absent. And then, so now let's see what could be uh, distinguished visually. And by the way, uh, for those who were there for, for my sign language, uh, talk. Sign language also distinguishes many of these uh, distinctions because sign language in general is closer to, to, to the fine-grained um, character of visual parsing. So for example, um, uh, visual vision and in fact sign language will distinguish uh, different degrees of, uh, of, of a circuit around something. In fact, this is, that what I'm going to show is in fact the, the way you would do it in American Sign Language. So if you say, I, I ran around the house for 20 seconds, you go like that. I ran around the house in one minute, with a sharp thing, I ran around the house in one minute. Um, I ran around the house uh, for a few minutes. I ran around the house for hours. Um, and all that you both sign and can see, visual perception. But in English, all you've got is around, 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 around. The word around doesn't change. There are no distinctions, uh, further distinctions marked. Similarly, uh, you can uh, visually uh, distinguish um, different geometric arrangements with, with uh, rotation. So for example, it, the, the spin axis can be at the center of the object, so like a rotating CD disc, or a, pen, a pencil spinning on its axis, or a propeller spinning around. These are all different geometric things, which you can easily see. None of it is distinguished in the closed class forms of, of language. Again, English is just around, around. 
propeller spun around, uh, I spun the pen around, and so forth. Um, similarly, there's a, it would be distinct if the, um, the spin axis is at the edge of the object, for example, um, um, uh, if you're sh shutting a door, here's the edge of a door, the door goes like that, or if you're swinging your cape, a plinger thing like that, uh, you're holding it at the edge. All of these is around, swung the cape around. Uh, visually, you'll know all these geometric distinctions. Linguistically, they're, they're bypassed in the, in the um, closed class system. And so finally, um, where the spin, uh, the axis of spin is outside the object itself. So, for example, the Earth revolving around the Sun, or a hoop, which is spinning. Um, uh, again, the, the Earth revolves around the Sun. The, spoon, the, the hoop spins around, it's still around. But visually you'll see a difference, conceptually you'll see a difference. Uh, and, and finally, uh, whether there's uh, consistency in the rotation. So if, the, if you've got a hanging rope and it's spinning around, if it all spins uniformly, you say it's spinning around. If it's stuck to the ground and this keeps spinning, then you'll say it twists, it twists around. So it's not uniform. But it's still around, around, around. Yet visually, you're going to parse that differently into different kinds of structure. So here again are uh, is, is a case where uh, vision uh, uh, is has a, a much finer, finer grained kind of uh, structuring system for the domain of rotation, let's say, than language does. And again, when I say than language, I always to what the closed class system does. The open class system can indicate many more things, such as the word twist, which automatically refers to this non-uniform kind of uh, uh, turning. Uh, but the, the open class form of language, the open class subsystem of language, I suspect, is um, uh, more correlated with other cognitive, with, with other cognitive systems, with, with, with say, the the distinctions available through visual and kinesthetic and motor control and perception, whereas the um, uh, the closed class subsystem of of, a lang of language is uh, uh, much more restricted. So another uh, comparison between vision and language is um, similarly uh, the, the uh, distribution uh, of vision has a, a much more extensive structuring system for the um, uh, patterns of distribution. So if you look at um, a foam on a beer, a beer foam, you look at the folds in a, in a robe uh, or in a curtain, uh, you, you can look at the you know, piece of wood, you can look at the grain of the wood. Uh, you can see many kinds of patterns of distribution and vision is, is supreme at um, that kind of structural delineation, uh, patterns of distribution. Whereas uh, in the closed class system of language is absolutely minimal. So, um, uh, for example, all that we have in English is, uh, and, let, and I'll just pick the case where it's static, um, you have either it's neutral to to whether it's discussing dis distribution or it shows um, uh, scant distribution or or dense sparse distribution or dense distribution. So, for example, um, we have distinctions like there are peas on the knife. There's a knife with some peas on. There are peas on the table. There are peas in the jelly, in the, in the jelly also, in the jello. Um, so that's saying that's neutral to whether they're dispersed or not. It doesn't, doesn't indicate it. Then you've got forms which indicate sparse dispersion. So for example, there are peas here and there on the knife. There are peas here and there uh, on the table. There are peas here and there in the gelatin. And then you've got closed class forms that indicate dense distribution. So there are peas all along the knife. There are peas all over the table. 
therapies uh, throughout the jello. Okay, the jello th throughout. Th throughout is specifically three dimensional. So it distinguishes one, two, and three dimensional. It distinguishes sparse from dense distribution. It distinguishes between presence of distribution versus neutrality to it. It, it also, as it happens, distinguishes between uh, static, stationary, and, and moving. But that's all. That's it. Uh, that's the extent of it. The vision distinguishes much more than that. So, for example, uh, nowhere in the linguistic dis distinctions made by closed class forms is there anything about um, whether the, the let's say the P's all over the table, are they evenly distributed or, or unevenly distributed? Nothing in language closed class forms tells you that. We'll, we'll make that dis make the distinction. But if you look, you'll instantly know if it's even or uneven. Um, are there clumps, clumps of peas on the table with uh, uh, whether even whether it's even or uneven? It doesn't matter. You could also have clumps. It doesn't matter. If you uh, say there are peas all over the table, it won't tell you. Um, are the peas um, completely dense, leaving, leaving no space between them, or are they spaced with some intervals between them? Nothing in your uh, in English all over will tell you that. But again, visually, you can tell instantly. If it's not peas, but spaghetti noodles, um, are they arrayed evenly, or are they crisscrossing, or are they scattered? Nothing in all over will tell you that. But visually, you'll instantly know. So these are these are ways that um, uh, visual parsing, uh, the parsing in this case means the determining the the structure of what you're looking at, um, uh, gives you much much more much finer uh, kinds of information than the language, which is relatively minimal. Okay, so if we draw two circles of what's overlapping, we've been looking at the things that are in vision but either absent from language or minimal. Now let's do the complementary thing. Let's look at things which are big in language and minimal in vision or absent from vision. Uh, okay, so that's the next section. And the first thing in that's uh, big, bigger language is, um, uh, what's the first one? Is uh, not locality, but uh, uh, yeah, reality status. Uh, so languages have all sorts of forms like, like negative, potential, conditional, counterfactual, um, and, and indicative, factual, uh, uh, which in fact probably every language has closed class forms that indicate distinctions like these, maybe not all of them by closed class forms, but at least some of these are going to be by closed class forms, um, and hence are structural in character. Uh, but nothing in a visual scene marks, nothing in your visual perception marks these distinctions. What you look at is simply there. There's nothing in, in, with visual perception which even recognizes this category of distinctions. Uh, the, the concept of it's not being there, or the concept of it's being potentially there, or conditional on something else, or in, uh, or in fact, it wouldn't be there, nothing. Uh, it's just there. So this whole category of structural distinction is present in language, absence in vision. Uh, the same can be said for um, a mood, a modality, or mood, which is modality. Um, the modals in, in language, a lot of languages have modals as uh, closed class forms, not all do, but uh, English has a closed class system of modals, which are things like can, should, must, need, dare, and so forth. And um, the, boy, so sensitive these um, these modals uh, uh, represent um, forces towards that act towards or against the occurrence of some event. Uh, for example, the um, uh, he should lock the doors when he leaves. There's somebody uh, experiences uh, tries to exert pressure on someone else 
to perform a certain action. Um, and, uh, or the, the pear must be ripe by now. There's um, some kind of notion, of epistemic notion, of um, uh, whether your, your, your inferencing system is constrained to come to just one conclusion. But uh, nothing of the sort takes place in vision. Again, what you're looking at is simply what has, ha what has occurred. It is there. There's nothing within the visual processing, the, pers the parsing of the visual scene, the perception of the scene, which um, indicates um, uh, something that has uh, caused it or made it inevitable or made it impossible or something like that. It's just there. OK, a third uh, structural thing with the language is um, the, in, uh, in addressee's inferred knowledge status. In other words, uh, uh, the, person who, the speaker infers something about the knowledge status of the, the, the hearer that he's talking to. Um, that's my term for it. Uh, the conventional term for it is definiteness, because I think that's what definite is. Um, so, for example, if I say, the difference in English, if I say, I fed the cat, if I say to you, I fed the cat, versus I fed a cat, if I say to you, I fed the cat, it means I infer that you can readily identify the particular cat I'm talking about, the particular reference of the noun. But if I say I, to you, I fed a cat, uh, it means I infer that you can't readily infer uh, the particular identity of the object, that you in fact don't know what it is, which one it is. So that's uh, another uh, structural feature of language, but again, it's, it's essentially absent in visual parsing. Very, very little, or, or minimal, very little of what you look at um, when you look at something, very little of your visual perception is involved with whether or not somebody else can identify the object as well. Um, okay, finally, uh, there's the reality status of the speaker. Um, and there's a conventional term for that in linguistics. It's uh, uh, evidentials. And uh, uh, there, there are some languages uh, are enormously rich in evidential distinctions, uh, including the language that I worked on uh, in American Indian language, Atsugevi, which marks a certain number of distinctions. Um, and languages like this, uh, with inflections on the verb, will, will mark distinctions like whether you, uh, for example, um, if you put on a certain one inflection, it means uh, I tell you it as a fact, like John is chopping wood in the forest. I, and you, I know it because I saw it. You put on a different inflection, and it means uh, I infer it through non-visual sensory input. For example, if you say, John must be chopping wood, um, and you put on this suffix, the idea is that it's because you can hear the sounds of the axe chops coming out of the wood. So you infer that he's chopping wood. Um, if you put on the... Um, uh, the one which is based on uh, evidentiary uh, evidence, um, you, and you put on that suffix and you say, John, you chopping wood, it's because, for example, you look where the ax usually hangs on the wall, and it's not there, so you can say, ah, John has to be chopping wood. You have to put on a third uh, suffix, different one. And uh, one more, uh, let's say John usually chops wood at uh, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. It's 3 o'clock, so you say, hmm, John must be chopping wood. That's a fourth different distinct suffix based on temporal periodicity. All of these distinctions are made, um, and they refer to the speaker's knowledge status. Uh, none of that appears in visual perception. Uh, it's, um, uh, it, you, again, what you see is what you get. What, that's an English expression. Uh, what you see is all that is what's there. And there's no question about whether or not you're, it's, it's, uh, you're inferring it or you're producing it or you're simply taking it for granted. 
that is just, well, it's just assumed to be actual. And in this case, we can uh, draw, um, in, bring in a third kind of uh, cognitive system, uh, just briefly bring in the understanding system or reasoning system. It seems to me that this kind of uh, knowledge status kind of thing, especially this last one of evidentials, is very similar to this another of the cognitive systems, the reasoning or understanding system. <clears throat> so if it is, then it turns out that if you draw circles, here's a circle for visual perception. It doesn't have this particular phenomenon of uh, knowledge status, let's say. Crisscrossing it is a circle for language partially intersecting it. And language does have it, but it, it has it over here. It doesn't have it within the part that intersects the circle because it's not in, not in vision. But yes, intersecting it is the inferencing, the, the, the reasoning, understanding system. It shows up in there as well as in language. So you can start drawing certain kinds of Venn diagrams uh, with, with partial overlaps to show that when some structuring system, uh, or feature is common to, to a couple of uh, close, couple of uh, 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 cognitive systems, but not to others. So that's the general case. This is an instance, therefore, where something, namely knowledge status, shows up across the understanding system and the, uh, the language system, but doesn't show up in the vision. Uh, okay, so now these were cases where we found things, uh, structural features that were in language but not in vision, or in vision but not in language. Now we can look at the overlap, where in fact the, the structural phenomena is in fact common to both of these systems. And um, uh, it turns out this is really expensive. And uh, I, I, again, I say I suspect that language, when it evolved, borrowed perhaps the most from the visual perception system. The first, the first thing that might be common in common would be um, uh, configurational structure. So uh, language has often has a lot of closed class forms. A lot of languages do, not all languages, for representing um, path configurations. Configurations of the path that something takes in moving, so or 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 the site that it occupies, a, a kind of geometric uh, delineation. So, for example, um, in is in English, like, such as there is water in the vase, there is a radio in the dumpster. It in, it involves the in involves a concept of two objects related to each other spatially in a certain way. The, what I call the, the ground object consists of a, uh, a plane so curved as to constitute a volume of space. And the other object, the figure object, located at some point or points of that volume of space. So you can say, therefore, that the, the radio is in the dumpster. Um, uh, I suspect that something like that is, uh, is visually perceivable. Uh, the, 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 there's a general perception of inclusion or of surrounding that might be perceived in a way that's quite comparable to what the preposition in means in English. The same for maybe along, like the, uh, the, the, the ball rolled along the ledge, or the hunter walked, al walked along the trail. It's the notion of uh, a, a moving path a uh, point, moving point describing a path which is parallel and beside, alongside, another linear path. Okay, well, that uh, is perhaps, perhaps also readily perceived as something, that I mean, is just a guess. I mean, a lot of what I propose as, uh, for other cognitive systems is offered as a, um, a suggestion for further research among the specialists in those fields, in this case, perception psychologists. Uh, so I, I suspect that some of the geometric delineations that show up in language preposition type forms, 
um, might well be perceived as such visually. Second, a second kind of overlap is, uh, is uh, structure within bulk, so within a volume. And again, this shows up in linguistic spatial forms. For example, take the word along. We just saw along. Along uh, doesn't care about the bulk of the, ob of the second object, of the ground object. It's neutral to the bulk. So therefore, you can use the same word along if you're talking about a caterpillar crawling up a thread, or here's a tree trunk, a caterpillar crawling up a tree trunk. It doesn't care. Uh, it's still along. It's along, along. <clears throat> All that along cares about is that this ground object can be idealized or boiled down to a linear um, abstraction. Uh, and again, I suspect that uh, visual perception may well have a similar kind of bulk abstraction. Something might, you might well perceive the same two events as, as similar. Even other chimpanzees without language might well perceive something in common across those two uh, uh, spatial relationships. Um, and this correlates with something that um, uh, Marr, who's uh, one of the, he's a late, uh, uh, perception psychologists uh, described as axes of elongation. Uh, he thought that as you look, for example, at a body form, you might well perceive in, in a subliminal way, my term for it is you, you might sense it within it, uh, certain axes of elongation, sort of like a stick figure drawing. And in fact, I'm especially impressed by the fact that children very early can draw what, what, what's called in English stick figures. So they, they go through a progression. So the early, earliest form of a stick figure of a human, in, in the, in the, at least in America, is, is typically something like a circle with four things sticking out of it. And that eventually develops into something like a circle for the head, a line for the body, two lines for the arms, two lines for the legs. <laughs> Um, this is cultural. Uh, it turns out that uh, Australian Aboriginal children do different different sets of abstractions, but uh, which are used by the adults. But they nevertheless set up connections to that, and so the whole closed class subsystem of English uh, of language for space, at least, may well tap into that specific sus subsystem and vision as it evolved. Uh, let's see what I'm saying. I should start speeding this up. Uh, let me just do, okay, let me do the third one, which is the topological thing. Uh, I also suspect that um, uh, topology, uh, one thing I, I mentioned in the, in the first um, talk was that closed class forms are uh, topological in character. So, for example, the word through in English, uh, it doesn't care about the shape of the line. You could say, let's say here in the woods, you could say, I went straight through the woods, or you could say, I zigzagged through the woods, you still say through, or I circled through the woods, you still say through. Through doesn't care about the shape. It's, it abstracts away from Euclidean geometry and just uh, uh, does to topological of geometry. I suspect, I suspect the same is true for vision, that <clears throat> it may well be that uh, there's an aspect of vision which is topological in character, and uh, so that it, you might be able to perceive a structural abstraction of inclusion, something inside something else, um, regardless of many other variables, like whether this is big or this is small, or this is curved or straight or, or whatever, you can, you can abstract away, uh, uh, I suspect your visual processing will abstract away a certain um, schema of inclusion as just as a visual uh, schem schematic abstraction uh, in the same way that it has is done in the closed class forms of, of, of language. So that would be another commonality. 
Um, I think, in, I think for the sake of uh, well, what I do in a number of these next ones is uh, it's, it's almost a recapitulation of uh, some of the talks I gave earlier, which already showed I, I, I was already in those pointing out similarities, parallels between. Um, spoken language structure and other forms of structure, such as visual structure. So let me not do that. Let me just skip to one that I didn't. I know I didn't present, and that's down to uh, perspective point, where I give this example of language. Here's uh, two sentences. I think for this I will uh, go to the board. So uh, here's uh, here's two sentences. One is. Uh, Here's a, here's a lunch room. <coughs> it's a restaurant that you eat for lunch in. <coughs> and here's the door. And the first sentence is uh, the, the door slowly opened and two men walked in. Where are you standing? This is a test of your English. Where are you standing? <laughs> In the, room, in the room, right. And you say instead, <clears throat> two men slowly opened the door and walked, uh, opened, two men slowly opened the lunchroom door and walked in. Where are you standing? Outside. Okay, that that's, doesn't quite have to be, but that's typical. OK, so why is that? Well, uh, when you, because of a principle in English, uh, if you, it's a, it's a structural principle of closed class forms in English. English has a general principle that if an agent is visible, or the initiator of some action is visible, we must mention it um, as uh, a subject. So, uh, whereas if it's not visible, we must not mention it as subject. This is a general rule. It's often broken, but it's an approximate rule. For example, if you have a glass, uh, and and you do this and it falls to the ground. You cannot say the glass fell. You have to say I dropped the glass because you're fully visible. Yeah. Right. So similarly, uh, if you say the door slowly opened, the lunchroom door slowly opened. Well, how is it possible for the door to slowly open across my agents? And you're not mentioning the agents. It's because of a principle, which is that you can't see the agents. Um, well, how come you can't see the agents? You, you say, the sentence goes on, the door slowly opened, and two men walked in. That means this is the direction of motion, they walked in. Therefore, they come from the first they're outside, then they're inside. Uh, well, there's only one way. The door can open. You can't see the agents doing it. And they start outside and inside. And that's if you, the observer, are already inside. There's only one geometric possibility, assuming that the lunchroom walls are opaque. Um, and through some lightning calculation of geometry and linguistic principles, if you hear that sentence, you automatically know to place your perspective point inside. But if you have a sentence, two men open the lunchroom door, they are mentioned, therefore they must be visible. Therefore, you're probably standing outside watching them do it. And when they walked in, uh, that's fine. They're walking away from you. But that in doesn't walk doesn't tell you if it's words are away from the speaker. And like come and go. So fine, you're outside. Um, so um, uh, here is, therefore, a, uh, an aspect of uh, language that structures uh, one of the, the great um, schematic systems that I, I treated in the first lecture, and that's uh, perspective point, location of perspective point. In the first case, your perspective point is located inside the lunchroom. In the second case, it's located outside the lunchroom. Um, uh, and uh, okay, so and it's, it's, there's it's it's ascertained through various structural devices. Um, well, I suspect that perspective points, location of perspective point, is one of the things that is um, highly 
um, part of uh, visual perception, visual parsing, uh, you automatically know the location of your own perspective point if you're here or if you're seeing something from over here or if you're seeing it from over there. You seem able to project your perspective point like you can pretty much tell what somebody else is seeing from their perspective. So you can project yourself into someone else's perspective and, um, and see what's happening. So, so this, uh, it seems like there's a, uh, this is a good additional example of overlap between uh, language and uh, visual per perception in terms of the structure. Okay, I think I'll end uh, the comparison between language and vision with this, and then go on to the next comparison uh, between language and uh, so this be section four. But between language and uh, affect. And affect is another system. <clears throat> um, means emotions and feelings and so forth. And uh, it would include, you know, anything like uh, uh, anger, liking, uh, hate, fear, all those kinds of things would be part of the presumed uh, uh, affect system, which I suspect our cognition has as a quasi-autonomous system, cognitive system, I mean, uh, separable in some respect from other aspects of cognition. So the question is, uh, is there anything structural in that that also is structural in, in language as showing, shown by the closed class forms? And in fact, the finding, rather surprisingly, is that it, there's, it's quite minimal. Language has very little that's uh, structural uh, with respect to affect. Uh, it has sporadic instances of uh, closed class forms around various languages that uh, refer to something affective. For example, it had the diminutives in many languages um, can represent uh, an, an affect of um, affection. The pejoratives in many languages can um, or, or do <coughs> um, indicate a um, an affect of uh, dislike or disgust. Uh, the uh, we have form we have uh, desiderative forms in many languages which indicate wanting optatives for hope. Uh, we have. Uh, Forms like constructions like the um, on me construction, like my plants all died on me, which indicates uh, reg uh, regret or, or feeling badly about something. Um, we have things like the closed class forms like lest, which indicate concern, like um, we should uh, clear the, uh, the floor lest he trip. Means for, uh, Concern for his tripping. Um, there is uh, affect like uh, surprise or amazement, like it's so vivid. So, so meaning expressing a kind of uh, affect. But that's it. Uh, it's sporadic, it's occasional. None of it seems to form into some kind of system. Uh, by contrast, with let's say languages with prepositions like English, which which together form a, a whole system for marking distinctions of paths uh, with respect to reference objects, or like the modals uh, in English, which is a whole system that subdivides um, uh, force dynamics. Nothing represents a system, uh, it constitutes a system in any language that I've ever encountered that represents um, a, a distinctional system for affect. I, now, uh, again, I encourage adopting the Martian perspective and so trying to uh, uh, invent what such a system, what would it look like if you had it? Well, so I invented such a system. So let's say um, uh, you've got uh, a, a parent and a child and they live in the, on the 10th floor. And here's an open window. The child is standing near the open window. Now the parent cognitively has a, um, 
a complex, a cognitive complex co consisting of both of spatial knowledge and emotional knowledge. The emotional, the emotional knowledge is uh, anxiety and uh, concern and fear for the child's safety. Uh, the spatial knowledge is that the child should uh, move away from the window. Well, within this total cognitive complex, which portion is expressed uh, within the closed class form of language? Well, it's the spatial. So English will say, get away from the window. And the parent might say, get away from the window. Uh, there is no emotional form, a uh, closed class form, which, which I invented here, which is something like, act a fear the window. I made up a word, a fear. It should be a closed class form, which indicates which should be one element within a system of uh, affect. No, nothing like that exists in English. Comparatively, or no, comparably, um, let's say in the same room, one wall is freshly painted. And now the child is near the freshly painted wall. The parent is now worried that the child is going to put his hands on the, on the paint and ruin the paint. So now the, the parent is concerned about the, the paint job, not about the child, and wants the child to be nice to the paint job, to act in favor of the paint job. And again, there's a spatial component, which is the child should move away, and there's, and there's a, an affective component of um, concern for the, uh, or desire for being nice to the, uh, or, uh, towards the, towards the paint. Well, uh, again, out of this total cognitive complex, which elements are abstracted away for closed class representation? Again, it's going to be spatial. Again, the parent will say, get away from the wall. The same expression, get away from. Um, and there will be no counterpart um, closed class uh, form representing, like, uh, again, I made up one, I invented one, act a favor of the wall. There's no such thing. So if I try to start out mapping uh, a system of uh, affective things, a fear, a favor, who knows what else. Um, but nothing like that exists. So uh, for some strange reason, uh, the uh, language seems to have drawn very little of any, of any kind of structure or character from the affect system. One possible explanation is that uh, the, the par paralanguage systems, such as facial expressions, body language, maybe, maybe gestures, I don't know, um, independently were, were, all, were present all along uh, in, in hominids, in primates, and may have been a, a system already so capable of uh, conveying uh, emotional states that language didn't bother to um, replicate this in its structural system. Who knows? But in any case, it seems to be uh, the case. Uh, okay. Third uh, comparison is between language and uh, and culture. Well, it's getting late. Uh, I think I'll make this maybe my last comparison. Um, okay, so language and culture. Uh, uh, and, and you could compare. So again, I I propose the existence of a portion of cognition, a system within cognition which is dedicated to picking up on cultural patterns and, uh, and manifesting them, it's orchestrating our cultural uh, structural behavior. Okay, so there's two ways to compare it. <clears throat> One is cross-linguistically as a, uh, compared to cross-culturally, so let's do that first. Um, uh, uh, George Murdoch was uh, an anthropologist who built, formed a list, built up a list of some 73 uh, features that in his, uh, in, in his time uh, seemed to be universal. In all of the cultures that were studied at that time, at that time 
Um, all cultures had all of these features. They all had uh, marriage ceremonies, they all had food preparation, they all had the legal systems, uh, they all had greetings, and so forth. They all had status differentiation. There's 73 of these there. Uh, well, uh, you'd think that there might be something that within this list of 73, at least some large proportion of them might be structural in character within the culture system. And, and maybe that's the case. Um, not simply a coincidence due to commonalities of how humans live their lives, but um, uh, actually structural, somehow wired into the anthropological system, to the cultural system. Well, of all of those 73, and most that I could find, were eight linguistic clothes class uh, types that seemed to correspond at all to any of those 73. And of those, only three or four had any extensive uh, clothes class representation or specialness. Uh, like one of the main ones would be um, uh, status differentiation, uh, which seems to run through all cultures. And uh, there are there is a lot of close class representation of status difference in language, for example, uh, the pronouns in some South American Spanish uh, that make three distinctions: vos, tu, and usted, for most familiar, semi familiar, formal, um, that kind of thing. All right. So and there's also for. Um, speak up. So that's politeness. And then you can, instead of directing someone to do something, you can suggest it as a courtesy. So you can say, why don't you go abroad? It's a suggestion. So you should go abroad. That's a, uh, an urging. So, so there, uh, the, this distinction of uh, courtesy, etiquette, politeness um, seems to uh, cross cultural bond uh, between cultural structuring and linguistic structuring. Um, but very little else. Uh, so there's rather minimal overlap. Let me take an example, switch down to comparing just an individual culture and an individual language. That's uh, yeah, single culture with a single language. That's page 136. And, um, and this, this is a former colleague of mine. Uh, uh, David Wilkins, who worked on uh, a language called Martwe Arnda, something like that. It's in, uh, in it's uh, uh, Australia, Australian Aboriginal language. And um, this language has several ha, ha, has several overlaps between its its own closed class forms and its culture. For example, that culture, as generally in Australia is enormously concerned with uh, kinship relationships uh, and, and with, with many different distinctions. Um, well, it turns out that some of that shows up in its pronouns. Uh, so for any of the plural, dual or plural pronouns, first, and second, and third person, there isn't just one plural pronoun for, for we. There's three, depending on the following things. A distinction. If everybody, if there are people within our group of three that are uh, or more that belong to separate patrimoyities, I don't even know what a patrimoyity is, but it's some kind of kinship distinction. That's one pronoun. You'd use a different pronoun if they belong to the same patrimoyity but were of different generations. And a third pronoun, if you used, if they belong to the same patrimoyity but were of the same generation. So here's a beautiful example of where um, uh, culture and language uh, uh, intertwine. But there's very little else. Uh, in fact, um, I took the opposite perspective on this from, from David Wilkins. He 
looked for these examples to show how much penetration into language there was from culture, but I turned it on its head. In fact, these are his best examples. Uh, he's got you know two best examples, and everything else looks, starts looking like um, uh, grammatical distinctions that are made in many other languages with vastly different cultures. So, uh, so it seems like the um, and again, surprisingly, the uh, structural delineations within culture are not much in overlap with those of, of the closed class systems of language. And I can, uh, taking this perspective uh, allows me to show how Benjamin Worf, how the Worf hypothesis fits in here. <clears throat> the Worf hypothesis, or at least one of them, has to be seen in the following perspective. Of all the cognitive systems, only two uh, have the following property, and those two are language and culture. They have the following property, namely, each of them has um, one portion which is universal, so it's the like universal grammar or universals of culture, which are true across all humans, and another portion which is locally changed, locally changeable. Um, hence, you've got different different particular languages different particular cultures. This is not true with visual perception. You do not have local variations of visual perception. It's all universal. You do not have local variations of motor control. Uh, there are a few things that change from culture to culture in how you move your body. But for the most part, it's, uh, it's uh, the same universal system. So only language and culture have this bipartite kind of distinction between universal and, and uh, particular. <clears throat> and the Worf hypothesis simply says that in any given uh, local place, the, the particular aspects of the language uh, uh, system of that lo locality is, uh, relates to, co correlates with the particular portion, the particularistic portion of the culture of that locality. So that's the that's what that's what the Worf hypothesis restated in this new perspective means. That's all it means. Um, the Worf hypothesis doesn't even apply to the first thing I gave about uh, George, the, the, the Murdoch list, and it certainly doesn't apply to, to any of the other comparisons. So, um, so the one, one nice thing about this framework of comparing cognitive systems is it, it allows you to place other uh, research endeavors into a larger framework. Let me just give you one taste of this next section. Uh, the next section is overlaps between the understanding system and language. And uh, in general, it seems to me that uh, there is something in common between all of the following. The, 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 the concepts expressed, expressed by the closed class system of languages around the world, there's something basic about these, all of the following. So the concepts expressed by the closed class system, um, the the structure present in infants and children in, uh, in any cognitive system, in their visual system, in their motor system, in their understanding system. Um, the, uh, the concepts or the structural, the concepts and structural aspects, no, yeah, this, I'm just going to refer to between uh, language and the understanding system, uh, not vision, but um, uh, in, uh, early science, or let's say the traditional lore within uh, various culture, traditional cultures, uh, within early science as opposed to developed science, and within casual science, when science, sophisticated scientists just talk casually and not don't try. There's something in common across all of those, um, which is some kind of core 
conceptual structuring, conceptual organizing system. That, that's my proposal. And, um, and so, for example, as a child develops, uh, the, um, uh, let's say, concepts of force, concepts of force, uh, the first concepts of force that a child is able to, to, to entertain, to experience, to understand, are precisely the ones that show up in the closed class system of language. Later, as the child acquires more complicated force concepts, those can no longer, the, the closed class system of language kind of seals off gradually, and no more, uh, no, uh, no further more complicated force concepts can make their way into the closed class system and must instead, if they're going to be expressed, be expressed by open class forms. Um, and so there's a kind of like, my, my idea is that there's kind of like a, uh, a core understanding system that's uh, common to early childhood, the closed class system of language, early science, which is a kind of basic structural system. And uh, uh, so one example of that, in, <clears throat> in force dynamics, which is this discussion of force, force dynamics has readily expresses uh, certain very fundamental uh, force relationships. So two forces uh, opposing each other head on is the most readily expressed uh, in languages. And it may well be one of the force concepts that children most readily grasp. A also expressed in the closed class system of languages, but less so, is radial, radial force imposition, compression down into a concentric kind of compression. For example, the Latin prefix con, the Latin prefix con, C-O-N, as in confine, contain, uh, I think one of its senses is to indicate force compression radially inward. Okay, and it may well be that that kind of force concept is within the infant's conceptual ability as in squeezing something. Um, still less represented by closed class forms is force that are in, forces that are in alignment. They show up in closed class forms like moreover, this principle, and this uh, buttresses it, um, and a few, a few other places. But it's not very, not very expensive. Maybe children have a small sense of forces in alignment. But um, not in closed class, not represented by closed class forms, are things like forces uh, approaching each other at an angle, or three forces coming together at some at odd angles intersecting, or a force acting over an arc instead of straight. Those are all much more advanced concepts. And it may well be that as a child grows developmentally, uh, uh, more adult portions of its cognition are in fact able to absorb and handle those particular conceptualizations. But by then, uh, the cl closed class system of language is kind of sealed off and can no longer, um, I, I mean, and it's sort of like there's a, a um, maybe a formative stage, a sensitive phase uh, of, in language uh, acquisition, which uh, permits the structural uh, importation into its closed class system of certain other structural co uh, system, aspects of other cognitive systems. But if they arrive after a certain critical phase, they can no longer enter the closed class system. Uh, and that's why we don't find these additional concepts in the closed class system. If we find them anywhere, they're only in the lexical forms. So that's uh, kind of like, uh, I'll end here, it, it, but just to give a quick idea, a summary of what I've been doing. Uh, it's again a, um, uh, a, a comparison across all the different cognitive systems 
major and ultimately minor, either the minor cognitive systems such as music. Um, and um, uh, I've been, uh, undertaken several pairwise comparisons, language and one X and language and Y, for the most part. Um, ultimately, uh, to see what is common across them, and in each case we found some things in common and some things uh, that are not in common across these pairs. And ultimately, you'd want to then look over all of these systems together and see which structuring aspects run in common through all of them, as I suggested at the outset, maybe hierarchical embedding would be one of those. Uh, and those would have to be the most fundamental structuring uh, aspects of cognition, I suppose. Um, uh, and if you pursue this kind of uh, project, ultimately you'll uh, wind up with something like what, are, is the, what is structure, what is organizational in human cognition. 